Hey everybody, Sean Allison here. Uh, figured I'd do a little video today on spear guns. Uh, this video isn't really going to be for you pro level guys. Y'all kind of probably know most of this stuff already. This is kind of more for the beginner or uh, people that are just kind of getting started out and they, or they don't know anything at all. Maybe, maybe they've never done this before and they're kind of just curious about, you know, what are the kind of the, the ins and outs of uh, these guns and how they work. So we're going to cover that a little bit today. I have some of my guns here. Um, pretty much any of the name brand uh, big makers out there, Omir, Rife, JBL, I, there's a whole long laundry list of them. Any of those are going to produce good guns, good quality guns. Uh, there are different types of guns. These are all band powered guns. They all have bands up here for loading. It's like a slingshot. It uses it like a just a rubber band to sling the, sh the shaft out there. Uh, there are air powered guns. There are spring powered guns. There's there's different types of guns. Uh, these tend to be simpler though, and that they tend to be a little more durable and bulletproof than some of the other ones need tight seals and things like that. So these are a little more forgiving if you bend the shaft and stuff like that. So without further ado, uh, we'll get into a little bit of what I have here. Again, there's a lot of good guns out there. I'm not necessarily advocating these over other guns. There's plenty of other guns just as good as these, but these are kind of what we have locally and what I've become accustomed to using, right? So, for starters, I basically have three size guns. I have, there's small inshore, there's kind of medium range, which is kind of a go-between inshore and offshore, uh, but it's not great or, or for either, and then there's strictly offshore. Now, on starting on the small side, on the inshore side, I actually have two of these small guns here because they're set up a little differently and I kind of wanted to show that. But these are both the 38 Special. This is a JBL 38 Special Northwest. Um, this is kind of my inshore jetty gun and maybe the inshore state water rigs for sheep's head, gray snapper, uh, things of that nature. With a gun assembled like it is from the tip to the butt is 43 inches, which is 109 centimeters. Kind of a small gun. Uh, you can get a little more range by holding it out at arm's length, but this is kind of my limited viz gun. It's good for really close range. Um, ultimately, the shock line, total length from your grip when the, the shaft is completely extended at the end of the line to the tip of the shaft. So from your hand to the end of that tip, once you fire it, maximum length is 12 foot three from your hand. You're actually only gaining nine foot four inches from the tip of the shaft once you shoot it, but overall range is about 12 foot three inches. Um, your effective range is really gonna be about half of that. You're not really gonna be trying to shoot at 12 feet with this gun, it's just really not meant for that. I would say effective range on most guns, whatever your total uh, line capacity is, let's say on this gun it happens to be a little over 12 feet, I would call my effective range somewhere around six feet, somewhere around half of that. When you start getting out beyond that, you, you run more of a risk of missing your shot and the shaft just losing power enough to really punch through that fish. All right? the bands on these, they're 16 inch bands. Uh, these normally come with the 5 8 uh, excuse me, these normally come with a 9 16 band, which is kind of smaller. I've upgraded these to the 5 8 uh, It gives a little more power, it's got a lot more punch. Of course, it's a little harder to pull. That creates a little more, uh, tension on the sear when you go to pull the trigger and the sear has to slide like this to allow the gun to fire that creates more friction there so that makes the trigger a little harder to pull you have to put a little more pressure on the trigger to actually get the gun to fire when you upsize the bands like this now if you want to power up the gun a little bit you can always go to thicker bands or you can use the same size bands and maybe go a little bit shorter I don't really recommend that because then you're just over stretching the bands and it's just much easier to go up on the bands but I wouldn't go thicker and shorter you're just not gonna be able to pull the trigger on the thing All right so I've beat both of these up a little bit uh, the main difference between most of these guns they both have a, a 28 inch shaft but this Northwest actually comes with a 3 8 shaft it's kind of a heavier shaft compared to the, the uh, 5 16 shaft on this one, I replaced the shaft, I put the lighter shaft on it. Now, you see there's a big difference. This one's much thicker than this one. They're the same length, but diameter-wise, one's thicker than the other. The difference with that being, this thinner shaft is, is lighter, and this gun is, the bands are the same, 
But because the shaft is so much lighter and they're all three notch, this one's gonna shoot a lot faster than this gun. Now, the catch is, now that's great for gray snapper, really fast fish like that. You want a really fast gun like this. Uh, but that's gonna be really good at really close range. Once the fish gets a little further out there, this, because the shaft doesn't have a lot of mass to it, it doesn't carry that energy as far. So this heavier shaft, the benefit of this heavier shaft is it gives me better range. Once I sling that shaft, it really wants to keep going. It's going to extend my range a little bit. And it's got a really hard punch on things that it does hit. The drawback to the heavier shaft is it makes the gun fire slower. Things are going to come out and just, just move a little bit slower. And that's fine for fish like sheep's head, uh, you know, uh, things of that nature that are kind of, kind of sit there and give you a profile shot. And they're just too dumb to really try to stay away from you. Um, it gives you really good punch on those guys, but for fast fish like gray snapper, this heavier shaft gun, it's, it's just not the best gun for it. I'd say this heavier shaft gun's really good for sheep's head and really up close shots on really scaly and bony fish. And the thinner shaft, lighter shaft's really just good for, mostly for gray snapper, right? But I have both. Uh, they both have a different muzzle on them. This one here, the muzzle setup where the bands are laying front to back. And they just kind of lay in the gun. Versus this, this muzzle actually spreads out side to side and holds the bands in position. This also helps line them up with the top of the shaft so it pulls straight on the shaft as the shaft comes out of the gun. Uh, honestly, my preference is for this style and not for this style. I've had these wings break off of here, trying to get the bands in, trying to pull them through. Sometimes if, this, if one of these pieces on here breaks off, this entire muzzle's useless, you need to throw it away and buy a new muzzle. So I don't really prefer this. I just happen to have it to fix this gun. I bought it at a pawn shop a long time ago. It has a little sight pin on it. I have never, ever, ever used this to aim at a fish, ever. So it's kind of useless to be on there. This one doesn't have it. It has a little, thin up here on top to help you try to aim, but I've never found that to be of any use either. Now, the tip on both of these are free spinners, meaning the, the tip is fixed to the shaft. It does not come off, right? Got these little tip protectors here. It's fixed to the shaft. It does not come off. It has two short wings. This one has short wings. This other one here has a little bit longer wings on it. Under the wings, there's a little piece of rubber tubing that goes through here. The purpose for that is it keeps these wings pushed out just a little bit. So when this goes through your fish and something encounters that wing, it wants to open instead of just slide back through the hole. So you want this to be in good, good condition. What you don't want to do is store your gun, which I see people do all the time, is fold these wings down. And there's a little collar right here. Okay. I'll get into what this collar is actually for, but what people tend to do is they push those wings into the collar and they leave it like this and they store it just like this. I don't recommend that because the, as the heat gets to this, that rubber is going to just soften up and it's going to turn to mush under there. When you take your gun out to shoot it later, you're going to pull this down and these are going to be stuck to that rubber. It's not going to push these out like it's supposed to. Do not store this with this collar on these wings. Okay, also, don't shoot this. We'll get to that later, but don't shoot this with this collar on these wings. The only time this collar should go on here is for removal from your fish. After you shoot a fish, and your fish is on the shaft, you're gonna pinch these wings, push that collar over the end of the wings, and then you can pull your fish off. Immediately after pulling the fish off, this should come off of there and not go back on until you're removing another fish. That's what this is for. If you shoot this and leave this in place like this, and I've done this on accident, this will go in your fish, and you would think the fish meat would push this collar down and allow those wings to engage. It's not always going to do that. This will pull right back out of the fish. I don't recommend leaving this collar on ever. I would only put this collar to remove this from a fish, and then I would remove it right after you remove your fish, right? So the tip on this one just kind of comes to a point like a bullet. This is called a rock point, right? This is good for round jetties and stuff like that. You hit rocks, it's a little more forgiving than a sharpened edge. And by sharpened edge, I'm talking about this one. It's a tri-cut. It's cut on three different sides. 
So not only does it have as a uh, does it have a point, it's got three sharp cutting edges that this one tends to cut through the fish a little bit better. But if you hit a fi uh, rock with this at the jetties, it's really going to destroy your tip. It'll destroy that one too, but the bullet point, the uh, the rock point, is a little more forgiving with that. But honestly, my preference is to have this tri-cut tip to the rock point. It penetrates a little bit better. Uh, safeties on these are real simple. These just have a literal thumb safety right here. That's safe. That's fire. So when I'm ready to fire, with my firing hand, I can literally just take my thumb on my firing hand and flip the safety down and pull the trigger to fire. So I don't have to swim around with the safety off. I can flip it off right when I'm about to fire. Really, really simple gun. Uh, it's got the retaining line here. Uh, this is somewhere 400 to 600 pound test. I can't remember specifically, but it's pretty heavy. And it has a little rubbery section right here in the middle. Now, inside this rubbery section, there's just, this line goes solid all the way through here. It is not cut and crimped here and here. It goes all the way through. The reason it's crimped is inside the tubing, this line is wadded up inside there and then it's crimped. So there's extra line inside of here. So when I pull this, eventually it reaches a point where I've run out of line on the inside and it's tight. It cannot get any tighter than that. That way I don't, otherwise when I shot a fish, when the fish swam off, this would just stretch and the rubber would break and the fish would swim off with my shaft in it. Right, so that's tethered. But the whole point of the bungee is so that when you string your gun up and you attach the line back to the gun to get it ready to fire, and you put it on your release here, when you pull the trigger, this releases this line. The whole point in that bungee section here is to allow this line to stay tight. Because without this, the line would be limp and it would probably just fall off here constantly underwater. So that bungee gives you something to pull against to put on the release and it keeps the line nice and tight up against the gun. All right, these run, the line runs on a little sling that attaches to the shaft here. Same on this gun. And ultimately, there's a flare on the shaft right here where that slide ring comes back and it stops right there. It can't go any further aft than there. So when the fish pulls, that ring comes back to here and he fights it out on the end there. All right, so again these are kind of smaller guns these are good for the jetties maybe the inshore rigs sheep's head kind of smaller fish i, I probably wouldn't shoot anything uh too too big with this right So next up, moving up to my mid-sized gun. This is kind of my go-between. This really is my workhorse. This gun gets used more than, than any of these other guns I have, right? This one's also a JBL, and it's a sawed-off Magnum. Okay, on the sawed-off Magnum, the length on this one, it's a little longer. It's 51 inches with the tip assembled and everything, which is 129 centimeters. Get the tip protector off there. Right, on this gun, shot length, when you pull the trigger from your grip hand to the tip of the shaft, once it's fully extended, is 15 feet, 8 inches. That's, that's almost 16 feet. That's quite a ways out there. This gun's not going to have uh, punch power once you get out that far, though. Again, effective range is going to be somewhere around half of that, so I'd say around 8 feet. Right, you're going to gain, you could actually, from the tip of the gun, it's going to travel 12, another 12 feet out of the gun. Uh, but generally with this gun eight feet and closer if they're further than that you, you just will kind of want to you you want to get as close as possible whenever possible the closer you can be to that fish the better I've shot fish where after I pulled the trigger the shaft didn't even clear the muzzle it was still in the gun I had to pull the gun off the shaft All right so the closer you can get the better uh, but I'd say effective range for this gun is probably somewhere around eight feet which is half of its total length 
right? The bands, they're 20 inch. They're a little bit longer. Uh, these are the 5 eighths. These are the bigger, heavier ones. This is the sawed off Magnum extra heavy duty. So it, it has a 3 8 shaft. It has a big, heavy shaft. It has a big, heavy bands. This thing's really meant to just punch holes through stuff. And it does a really good job of that. Uh, but it is the heavier shaft, so it does shoot a little slower. I did have cable on this gun instead of this, this normal Dacron, whatever this retaining line is. Uh, but because of the heavier shaft and the cable, the cable slows the gun down even more. This gun was shooting way, way slow. I do tend to shoot at Gray Snapper with this sometimes and I have a hard time hitting them with the cable on here. So I recently swapped this out uh, back to this line. So I'm, I kind of go back and forth on that. But it picks the speed back up on this gun a little bit. Uh, the shaft on it is 36 inches. Again, it's 3 8 It is a heavier shaft. Uh, the tip on this one's a little bit different. This is not a free spinner. If you look, the tip completely comes off of this gun. We call this a breakaway, right? The purpose for a breakaway is generally when you're shooting larger fish, they're going to fight harder. Uh, if you hit them somewhere in the muscle tissue where you don't get a good anchor point, they're liable to tear out. Uh, not only that is if you shoot a bigger fish like a big cobia something like that and you run your shaft through him perpendicular well when he swims away from you your shaft is going to be sticking out the side of the fish so when he comes tight and the line comes tight and you start fighting him you're now putting a bend in that shaft and, and it will probably just pretzel your shaft i've seen shafts come out of the water in a complete u before um, the breakaway tips help eliminate that because once this punches through the fish these wings on the back here catch and the tip deploys. The tip doesn't need wings because the tip itself is the wing. This is what, when you get a full through and through shot is what you want. This tip deploys, comes out and tees on the other side of the fish. Just like that. Can't come through and your fish is on the line here in the middle. He's not pulling directly on your shaft. He's free to fight out here without bending your shaft. That also helps uh, keep him from tearing out because now he doesn't have the leverage of the shaft pulling perpendicular to his motion uh, to, to wallow a big hole out. I've seen big fish wallow really big holes out and the shaft just kind of fall right out. Uh, but basically there's nothing to really retain that here. Some of these have an o-ring here and I'll show that on my bigger gun but I've actually removed the o-ring. I don't like anything here that can potentially uh, interrupt this tip deploy i want this to deploy as easy as possible now the question is you can set that down there. the question is how when i put this on here when i point my gun down how do i keep the tip from falling off because when you point the gun down the tip absolutely falls right off right so to get around that that's what this little line is i have a little line tied to this little line this one's a little weaker. This one doesn't need a hold of fish. But what's gonna happen is once I load the gun up, after I load the bands and the safety's on and whatnot, and we'll go through this too, I'm gonna place my tip on. And I'm gonna take, once the bands are loaded and they're pulled tight down here, I'm gonna take this white string and poke it between two of the bands and pull it tight just like that. That is gonna hold my tip in place no matter where I point it. And it's kind of caught between the stretched bands. When I pull the trigger and the bands let go, this will pull right through the bands and stay on the shaft as it travels through the water, but it will deploy very, very easily once it the fish pulls against it. Right, so that is a separate adapter here that screws onto the shaft. This tip is hard mounted directly to the adapter. It doesn't slide up and down the shaft or anything. That, that's all you get right here. Right, on this one, this one does have a closed muzzle also, just like the other two, meaning it encloses the shaft up here at the front. One of the things I did on this gun, it makes a lot of noise. These do have these metal wishbones, right? And what these metal wishbones do when you fire the gun, aside from the rubber just snapping, is these metal wishbones tend to come up here, and as the shaft's leaving the gun, they come up here and they slap the back of this muzzle really hard. They go, blam, and it makes a really loud noise when you pull the trigger. I've cut this at an angle to help ease some of that. It's, it helped a little bit, just not really a whole lot. Uh, but I've modified this gun quite a bit. I have my tape on the side. Obviously, you don't want to shoot anything that might be undersized. This isn't for me to make sure they're legal. This is just when I shoot fish that are well over legal, I can kind of get an idea about how big they are. 
right? Same thing with the safety as, as the other two JBL, simple thumb flip safety, one piece handle, loading butt on the back, line release right here on the side. And this stays locked while the shaft is engaged and you haven't pulled the trigger. As long as the shaft's seated properly, this won't release this line, right? Uses for this one, uh, this one's not so great at the jetties just because of the length of it. You're gonna find yourself trying to shoot like this a lot of times and pull back on the gun because your, your visibility is so limited most of the time at the jetties. A lot of time vis is out to your fingertips. Um, but this is really good at like state water rigs, things like that where you get maybe you know six to 10 foot vis and even offshore where you've got really, really good vis. I've shot Amberjack and Cobia, things like that with this, and it's handled those just fine. So this is a really good go-between gun. Um, you know, it, it's a, it shoots a little bit slower. It's not the best gun for Gray Snapper, uh, but for just about anything else, this, this really is my workhorse. All right. Moving up to the big boys, right? Now we're out of getting out of JBL territory. This is my rife, it's a Noka Oi. Right? This is my big big gun. I can't even get it all in the frame here. There's a lot, there's a lot of it, right? Big long gun here. Right, so this gun again, it's a three-band. Uh, this one's a wood gun though. I've I've placed a weight belt on here. I tend to lay this on top of the rig a lot, or when I'm fighting a big amberjack, I'll use the rig as leverage. This helps keep me from damaging my gun too bad. I do have cable on this. This is 1 16th stainless steel cables, 500 pound test. I have had amberjack break this stuff. I had one last year during a spearfishing tournament, literally break my cable. Uh, right in the middle of the cable too. It wasn't even out of crimp. Uh, it does have the bungee section in here to allow my cable to be tight once it's on the release. Uh, this is some really heavy duty doubled up stuff. This is at least as strong as the cable is. Uh, but I do have to be careful I don't rub this because it's not cable inside of here. Uh, so I can technically cut through this if I rub it on the rig too much. Um, little trick here, sometimes these rubber pieces will start, the rubber will start tearing here and it'll start pulling free. Take some dental floss and wrap it just on the other side of the tear, tie it off real tight. And you can kind of extend the life of these things quite a bit that way. All right, so I got my cable attached there. Uh, comes back, and on this gun, instead of the cable coming up and attaching to a slide ring, it actually comes up and comes through the front, and it's hard crimped to one of the fins on the shaft back here. Totally different than the way those other guns are set up. All right, does have a little bit of a loading butt. This is a mid handle. Uh, most of these guns have a handlebar back here. This one's a lot more forward. This one's a mid handle, which makes it, it has its benefits. Uh, but the drawback of that also, what you have to remember is all these guns do kick, and the bigger they are, the more they kick. This gun, because it's a mid handle, when you hold this out, it's not very far from your face. And I, I do have to admit, I have, I have kicked myself in the mouth with this gun before. Um, honestly, I tend not to shoot this gun this way. I do have a tendency to butt my palm against the, the base of this gun like this. It helps me with aiming, it helps me aim the gun, plus it helps lock it out there and keep me from having the gun kick me in the face. Okay, length on this gun is 73 inches. That's six foot one. That's that's taller than I am, that's pretty big. That's 185 centimeters. Right, shot length on this, at, at full extension from your grip, from the grip on the gun to the tip of the shaft at full extension is 19 feet 8 inches that's almost 20 feet so again effective range i would call about 10 feet this gun will punch all the way out to 10 feet if you use all three of these bands right so that's 14 feet from the end of the gun you're gaining 14 feet when you pull the trigger but if you add in the length of the shaft and the length of the gun to the to the trigger it's 19 foot 8 right so but again effective range about 10 foot 
These are 26 inch bands. These do not have the metal wishbone that the JBLs had. These actually have, this is the same type of line as the retaining line on the other guns. It's really heavy stuff. Uh, but the other guns actually have notches in the shaft where these metal wishbones slide back and they drop down into that notch. This gun is different. These pull back and this is actually a rest tab, right? You can't load this in one motion. This gun's really just too long and we'll get to that. But there's a rest tab, you pull to here and then you move this butt loading butt to your chest. Then you load the rest of the weight on these three fins in the back back here, okay? But they hook on fins, not inside slots in the shaft itself. That creates weakness in the shaft and when you're loading this much power, if you had cuts into the shaft, those are weak points. The shaft would buckle at one of those points and it would, it would just bend it and, and potentially break it off. Right, the shaft on this gun, it's 60 inches. This gun actually came with a 55 inch shaft. Again, when my cable broke last year, the, the amberjack I shot, really big amberjack, he took everything except for the gun. Uh, so not only had to put new cable, I had to get a new shaft and everything. I already had a backup shaft. It is longer than the original. The original's 55 inches. This one's 60, so this one's a little bit longer than the original shaft that came off of it. Uh, and it's 5 16 it's a little narrower, but there's a lot of shaft here, so it still has a lot of mass to it, and it has a lot of energy and a lot of punch out at range. You don't really need to go with a heavier shaft here. I wouldn't recommend it. But again, be especially because this is a narrower shaft, I definitely recommend a breakaway tip. Without a breakaway tip, with those floppers on here, those, those floppers are great. They penetrate great. Very little resistance going through. The catch with those floppers is, again, the fish is going to get down here. And you're going to be pulling on your shaft like this against the fish fighting away from you. And they're, they're a pain to get off too. They don't have a little collar to hold the flopper down while you pull your fish off. So they can be a little bit of a chore to get, get off of there. All right, so I've got the breakaway on mine. Again, this one had an O-ring in that little trough right there. I've removed it. The tip has a little bitty hole in it right there. The purpose for that is when the O-ring's on here and you shoot your fish, that hole allows the tip to come off so that there's not some kind of a suction in here. You get a kind of a suction when the O-ring's on if you block that hole and you pull on it, you get a suction. It doesn't deploy very well. So they put this hole so it can pull air in so that it can deploy. Well, the problem is that only works when this goes completely through the fish, comes out the other side and there's no meat in that hole. That's not usually the case. A lot of times there's meat gets stuck in this hole or it stops inside the fish and doesn't come completely out. Well, now you're plugging that hole and if you have that O-ring, your tip doesn't want to deploy and it ends up pulling out of the fish. So I've done away with that O-ring. I want this to just fall right off of here. And again, I've just attached a little metal ring with my line here. This one's a little different. This is not hard fixed to the adapter. This one is designed on a slide ring. Right, so this one, I have to pull the ring down to, to the bottom, then I can tuck it in my bands, and that holds my tip in place. The benefit to that is, when this goes through my fish, it's a real clean, narrow object going through all the way. The drawback to it being hard mounted to my adapter here, is that when this one goes through the fish, it has to push this and this and this and all this line and all this stuff wadded up has to get shoved through my fish for it to retain them. This is a little sleeker. It goes through, it punches through a lot easier. Okay, but necessity, is there a necessity for this slide ring on the shaft here? Not really, honestly. It's, I would almost prefer it to just be hard mounted to the adapter here. Because the problem with this is every time I'm loading the gun, because this gun has no muzzle, and I'll get to that when, I'm, when we go over loading it, when this is off, this wants to slide all the way down here while I'm in the process of stringing and loading the gun. And I, that kind of annoys me. That wouldn't happen if this were mounted up here permanently. Right, so again, this one's a tri-cut. It's a breakaway, it's got wings on the back. Just a simple tri-cut point that sits on this adapter here. And of course, there's a stop on either side here. 
and, and the adapter here can can stop this these are to stop larger shaft adapters where they can slide all the way up to there but that keeps them from coming off the end of the gun right uh, uses for this one this is really just an offshore gun this is not something i would even consider even taking to the jetties i mean i would barely even consider using this at state water rigs this is kind of my 20 plus mile offshore kind of gun amberjack cobia i you know if it's under if it's under 15 pounds 15 20 pounds i generally don't even shoot at it with this gun right so this is my big fish gun my offshore gun right i do have a loop through here this this isn't just rubber there's actually cable inside of here so that i can clip this thing off now you never want to clip these off to you you never want to shoot a fish and have the gun attached to you or have a wrist lanyard you know a lot of people want to build some kind of a wrist lanyard the problem with that is if you shoot a really big fish and he takes off that loop's going to come tight around your wrist and while he's pulling you're not going to be able to get your wrist out of the loop and if you're free diving that's a really big problem it's still a problem if you're scuba diving but it's really a big problem if you're free diving Right, so uses for this one are they're um, big and big fish, pretty much strictly offshore. All right. All right, so let's get into loading. We'll start with the small guns first. All right, so loading the gun, these bands all kind of lay in a particular pattern here, right? We'll make sure that they're not inside and out of each other, things like this. Kind of take them out and lay them the way that they are, they are naturally laid in the muzzle, right, to get them ready to load. Now, when it comes to loading this, you never want to really load this out of water. I'm going to do this right now for demonstration purposes, um, but don't load these out of the water. You should get in the water, load it in the water, use the gun. When you're getting ready to get out, unload the gun in the water, then get out of the water. You should never have a loaded gun out of the water or hand a loaded gun into the boat. You, generally, when these things are dry, they should not be loaded. They should be loaded and unloaded in the water, right? So before we're gonna jump in the water and try to use this thing and shoot stuff with it, we wanna test uh, functionality. We wanna make sure everything's working right. Our wings are loose, they're not seized up. The little collar up here is loose. My bands don't have cuts and breaks in them. They don't look, uh, especially right here behind the crimp. When you kind of stretch them a little bit, if they start looking like the material's separating from itself, they're starting to get old, they're starting to dry rot, they may break on you. That's another reason not to load these dry. If you have a band break in your hand while you're dry loading it, it's happened to me, okay? <laughs> Learn from my bad experience. It's gonna hurt a lot, it sucks. Don't do it, don't dry load these things, right? So, functionality, come back here, the safety's on. My line release is tight. It's not releasing the line right now, which it shouldn't. So I'm gonna take my, I'm gonna, Pull on my shaft, I'm gonna pull on the trigger. The safety's working. I know the safety's not gonna let the shaft go on accident. It's working, right? So now I'm gonna take my safety off. I'm gonna pull the trigger. When I pull the trigger, this line should dump this green line here. I'm gonna pull on it a little bit over here. Of course it's not gonna release. As soon as the shaft comes out, this goes limp and it dumps the line. Now this this won't hold the line anymore. You try to put it on here, it's just going to pull off because the shaft's no longer in the gun. Right? You take the shaft completely out of the gun. This kind of helps keep the shaft centered in the muzzle. Back on this end, you've got the stop. That stops everything from sliding rear, rearward from here. Then you have your three notches. You can see how deep those cut into the shaft. 
Then you have the rear end of the gun. These are different on all guns. The way that these things seat into the, the gun and the sear holds it right here. When you pull the trigger, the, the sear is allowed to pull out of the way and the bands propel the shaft outward. Right, so if we have the shaft out of the gun, first thing we need to do is put it in the gun, right? A lot of times after you shoot, your bands will kind of flip to the front or be like this. You want to be careful when you go to load this that all of your bands are flipped backwards and you're going through the bands. Otherwise, you're going to start stringing it up. You're going to realize you've got bands trapped in here and you can't, it's non-functional. You have to take the whole thing apart and start over. So always flip your bands, slide your shaft in the muzzle here. You want to lift up on those bands so the shaft goes under them, right? And I kind of protect it until these fins get clear. Otherwise, they keep snagging the the, the the wishbone here, right? And with this facing downward and these on top, slide the gun all the way back until it locks in. I heard it solid click, and I felt the solid click. First thing I want to do after seating it is put the safety on. One thing I've learned about these guns anyway is that if you push this in, and I've pushed this before and felt the click and I thought the gun was seated and I tried to put the safety on and the safety would not engage and I couldn't figure out why the safety wouldn't go on and I reached up here and I pushed harder on the shaft and I felt it click again, click harder and, and it seated the rest of the way. Then I was able to put the safety on. So what that means is if you seat the shaft and you go to put your safety on and the safety won't engage, there's a pretty good chance your shaft is not seated in the gun. So always do that first after you seat your shaft because when you load these bands on here, if it's not seated and something gives, the shaft's coming out of the gun while you're in the middle of loading it. Right, so we'll kind of put the safety on, pull on that a couple of times, that, that's nice and secure in there. Pull the trigger, it's not firing, good. Now my line retainer is now locked in place it's locked in the open position in, or in the uh, the lock position I'm going to take my retaining line and not from the rubber section we're going to start on the other section up here where it connects to the slide ring on the shaft we're going to bring it all the way down the gun to the release back here we're going to go back to the front of the muzzle there's actually a spot right here for us to loop this line over now we have that bungee section that we can stretch and snap our line onto our release. Now our guns, it's strung up and it's ready to go. It's ready to be loaded, safety's on. Right now, loading the gun. These bands really need to be loaded in order, right? Um, oh, quick note before I forget. On this retaining line, Right now I have one, two, three, uh, four links basically, double the length of from here to here. A lot of people want, and this line comes longer, you put it on here and you trim it to length, okay? What a lot of people want to do is, they want to put another wrap on the gun, put one more wrap, I can get more range, I can shoot further now. I don't recommend that, there's a couple of reasons why. One is, it's not going to extend the range of your gun because by the time it gets to the end of this length, it's out of power. Anything beyond that is just extra line in the water. On top of that, you're very limited on space on the release right here. That third wrap is going to have a hard time. It's going to keep wanting to fall off of this release. Right. Plus, after you shoot the fish, um, you're going to have a lot more line in the water to deal with. And it's just, it's just more of a leash out there. And... I just don't really recommend putting an extra wrap on the gun uh, compared to what it normally comes with, right? Um, you want to make sure there's no knots in it either because once this pulls tight, it's going to cinch those knots down where you're going to have a really hard time getting them out, okay? All right, so we're going to load the gun up, right? We're in the water. We're about to load her up. We've got the, the shaft seated, safety's on, the line's strung up. We always want to keep the gun pointed in a safe direction, right? We're, always, we're usually diving with a buddy in some respect. We want to make sure we don't accidentally point our gun at our buddies. I've seen people do that. I've done that on accident where I kind of looked and realized, whoa, you just, just be very aware, just like a gun. It doesn't have the range of a pistol or a rifle, but it'll do a lot of damage if you accidentally shoot somebody with it. So be wary of where you're pointing this thing at all times, right? Treat it like a gun. You want to load these bands in order. These are laid in this muzzle in a particular order. I've got the, the blue one 
and then that one, and then the front one. When I load this, what I don't want to do is take this one at the very front and pull it over the top of these two and put it in any of these notches because then the problem becomes I can't load my other two bands now. The one on top is over the top of them and they're trapped underneath it. So we have to start loading from the bottom up. So we're going to start with this bottom band down here, this first band. And when we load it, same deal here. That first, that bottom band is going to come and go in the very first notch. If I take that bottom band and I go to the second or third notch, when I start grabbing the next bands to bring back, I'm not going to be able to load them because I've already got one band covering the notch. Right? So starting with the, the bottom band or the closest band back here, I'm going to take the loading butt. These JBLs have a really nice solid loading butt on them. And I'm normally going to plant it right here in my hip where my, my leg bends. And plant it right here in my hip. Okay. Now, when I get ready to load these, hand placement on the bands is kind of important. Again, I've had these things break in my hands before, uh, especially with these metal wishbones. The tendency is to grab it just like this and to pull it just like this, right? The problem with this is when you pull, the tendency is you want to pull your hands apart. You want, your hands naturally want to do this, and you're trying to pull straight back. But that V is in there. And the problem is when you pull back, you take that V, the wishbone, and you open it with your hands. You bend in it straight. And then when you hook it on to the notch, the band pulls it tight and then it bends it back into V. Okay? So you're essentially doing this with the metal. And over time, these uh, wishbones will fatigue. And every time I've had a metal wishbone fail on me, they've broken right there in the middle. Right? The curved ones are less likely to do that than the ones that are more of a V. But, again, I've had them break and they broke right in the middle. So to, uh, try, to try to avoid fatiguing the metal in that fashion, what I've become accustomed to doing is when I get ready to load this gun, I will, you will grab both ends just above where the wishbone is crimped on here. Keep your, bring your, roll your thumbs up and roll your thumbs together on top of the gun. And when you pull back, keep your thumbs on top. That will keep you. That'll help keep you from pulling outward on the uh, wishbone when you load it. So it'll look like this. Kind of put your thumbs thumbs together up here. And when you do this, you can take a big breath and exhale. And but I highly recommend don't stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch and, stretch and try to pull this back here nice and slow. You're gonna. You're, it's just not gonna work. This needs to be one solid swift motion where you, everything you've got, you should grab that and pull it back. And while you're pulling it back, it's probably going to slide down the top of the shaft. And when it hits that first notch, it's going to snap and just lock right down in there. At that point, you can let it go and pull your fingers out, right? So to load it again, one swift motion, just like that. You don't want to take your time about pulling this, put everything you have into it. On, on that one pull that's all it should take so now I'm gonna move up to my next band again I'm in the first notch now I'm gonna move to my second notch same deal I'm gonna pull in until it kind of and it's just gonna fall right in there as I'm pulling it back I'm kind of pushing down on the back of it it kind of just locks in there all right going to my third band same thing that one's got a whole lot of stretch on it Gun's loaded. The gun's ready to fire. Okay. Now, I see a lot of people, and I've done this before, and I haven't regretted this yet, but I'm sure someday I will. I do not recommend carrying the gun around like this while it's loaded. I have a tendency to do this when you got gloves on. You think your hands are bulletproof underwater, uh, but if one of these bands breaks while you're carrying it like this, or you rub it against a barnacle and pow, the band snaps, it's gonna hurt. It hurts quite a bit. Right, so that's loaded up. It's putting a lot of tension on these cut points on the shaft, but it's got power, but it's not quite enough to bend the shaft in half, right? So that's the that's essentially the loading procedure. Um, load them all in one swift motion. It's on, safety's on, it's ready to fire. Now, when I'm ready to fire, all I gotta do is point at my fish, flip my safety down, pull the trigger, and the shaft's out of the gun, right? When it comes to unloading your gun, let's say, you either didn't have a successful hunt or it's at the end of the day you're done hunting you're headed back to the boat you're done 
a couple of different ways you can unload the gun. One is to just point a horizontal and pull the trigger and just shoot it. That's the easy way. Um, the problem with that is afterwards you have to restring it because now you just shot your gun, right? Which is probably less, maybe, well, I don't know. <laughs> you might be able to consider that less trouble than uh, actually unloading it, unloading it, but just make sure if you're gonna shoot it, don't really shoot it downward, shoot it horizontal. When you shoot downward, the shaft tends to speed up and not slow down, and you could potentially uh, break your line or break a knot when that shaft hits the end of it shooting downward so shoot it horizontal if you don't want to shoot it horizontal you can manually unload the bands in the reverse order in which you put them in uh, of course you got to start back here at the back you got to dig your fingers down inside of here right you're going to take a big breath and pull toward you and pick up on the back and then ease it forward same thing for the next one and the last one now the gun's unloaded. If these bands are not stretched back here, the gun's not loaded. It can't. I can pull the trigger, but the shaft will just kind of slide out if I point it down, and that's it. Right? So there's, there's the basics on loading. When, again, when these are loaded and these bands are really stretched back here, especially when you're jetty spear fishing or you're uh, spear fishing on a rig, there's barnacles on everything, and it's real easy to, to go and rub your gun against something. But when these bands are stretched, you have to be very careful because they're stretched, any slight cut to it is gonna cut really deep into the band and potentially completely cut your band in half, right? All right, so that's the small gun. The medium gun is the same the, uh, as, as the smaller gun. The only difference is once I load my last band here, start it so starting at the back Ooh, that band's got some tip cuts in it there right so now this gun's loaded up I'm gonna take my shaft you can't do this until the bands are loaded because the string won't stay between the bands until you load them so I'm gonna place my tip on and I'm gonna take this string I'm just going to tuck it in between two of these and try to pull one of these bands apart. And that's it. That's going to hold my tip in place until I pull the trigger. Again, when I pull the trigger, this is going to pull through and the, sh and the tip's going to stay on as the, the shaft travels until it hits something and it's going to deploy. All right, same thing unloading this one. Right, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. <laughs> now for the big boy, this one's a bit different, right? So we got our shaft out here. I like to put the, uh, the tip on just to keep this from sliding down while I'm messing with the gun. So let's assume, let's do the whole procedure here. My safety's out. Take the shaft out of the gun like I just shot at something. Okay, so now my shaft's out of the gun. This is my safety on this gun. This gun does not have a flip safety. That is safe. That is off safe. And that's off safe with the, the safety stored. Because of this, you can't take the safety off when the fish swims up to you. You have to swim around with the gun on ready to fire. This is too complicated to try to undo when a fish swims up to you, right? So you'll swim around, you'll take this off. Once you get it down there, you get loaded up and you start hunting, you'll take this safety off. Again, this has a line release. This one does not have a closed muzzle. This is all open on the end here. The shaft can just like literally just flop up and down on this thing if it weren't for the retaining line. So again, we're gonna make sure to flip our bands back. We're going to take our shaft from the butt end, the part that's going to go down to the, the sear of the gun, and slide it through the bands. But again, this is not on a slide ring. This isn't going to slide to the front like it did on the other guns. So this is actually going to get slid through the bands with the rest of the shaft. And what I do to make this easier is I grab this with my right hand. I align these springs on top. 
and then I start pushing the shaft in there is a little bit of a trough here for it to follow but that will go all the way back to the back and lock in position now this is where this gun gets to be a real chore at this right now the shaft is seated in the gun but this is loose this tip always has a tendency it wants to slide down here while I'm trying to string the gun up but I can't do that that's gonna mess me up because now I can't get the tip on the gun because it's gonna be caught under this so this has to stay out on the end while you're doing this but it doesn't like it really doesn't like to do that so I'll put the tip on there just to keep it on the end make sure that's laying in the trough now my cable comes out through my bands here where I slid it through comes up here What I'm gonna do at this point is take my cable and there's a retainer here. This is gonna hook under that retainer, go over the shaft and into a trough cut into the gun here. And it's this retaining line that's holding the shaft in place, right? So now I come down, I got my bottom loop. I can pull my rubber bungee section tight place that on my line release which is now locked in place because the shafts in place right so now it's strung now to get ready to load it put my safety on it's just a mechanical stop now with this gun I can't just put it on my hip and pull the bands all the way down to these fins there's there's just miles of space in here it's just too far and too much effort so this is where this rest tab comes in so to load this gun same thing though there's an order to these bands and i want to use the bottom one first or the closest one first okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to place this in the same place i did the other guns right here in my hip i'm going to grab my first band and bring it down to this rest tab and let it go once i get it to here I'm going to move the gun to my chest right in the center of my chest right between my pecs here and grab the bands and load them the rest of the way bring them the rest of the way back here that takes a little more effort getting it the rest of the way back here i'm going to do that with all three in order just like the other guns front and number two and then number three and then the gun's ready to fire when i pull the trigger the retaining line that's holding the shaft in place it's going to release and now it's not holding the shaft everything's free it makes a lot less noise coming out of the end of the gun because it's not rubbing something on the way out. Unloading this can be a chore too, but again, this one has the breakaway. Once I loaded all three bands up, I would bring this line down here and tuck it into the band to hold my tip in place, all right? And I sharpen this every trip. It's real easy to overlook these tips and get out there and keep shooting with a dull tip. A simple hand file or a small grinder will do a lot toward making these sharp again. All right. All right. So a few things about shooting the gun. Right. We'll move to a small gun because I can just handle it easier. Right. So when it comes to shooting fish underwater, fish have a lot of regulations and you need to know your fish you need to know what a sheep's head is you need to know what a gray snapper is anything you're potentially going to shoot you need to not only know what it is you need to know if it's legal to shoot because anything that's considered a game fish in texas you're not allowed to shoot it's by polar line only so what's a game fish well just because it has a bag and size limit doesn't make it a game fish right there's a specific list of fish and you can find any of that through texas park and wildlife but if it's a game fish you can't shoot it right and not only that is even if it's not a game fish like a sheep's head it still has a minimum size you have to you have to hit it at a minimum size right so you need to know what that minimum size is and also once you know the fish you're shooting at and you know what the minimum size needs to be uh, the next important thing to understand is that underwater water has a really uh, strong magnifying effect right 25 percent when you look at an object underwater, it looks 25% closer than it really is. If it's 
If it's 10 feet away, it looks like it's seven and a half feet away. It almost looks like you can reach out and touch it. And you reach out and all of a sudden you realize it's a lot further than you thought it was. Right? So that's very relevant when it comes to shooting fish. They're always further than you think they are. On top of that, the water also has a magnifying effect and it makes objects look bigger than they actually are by about 25% that's also relevant when you're shooting a fish that has a minimum size to reach and he looks like he's 20 inches and you shoot him and you get him in your hands and he's actually only 15 or 16 he looked a lot bigger than what he really was right so that's something to keep in mind when you're shooting a fish know your species know what the minimum sizes are but not only that is when you take a shot on a fish that fish should look well well above what you think the minimum size is if he looks like he's probably barely legal he's not don't pull the trigger you'll be killing that fish for no reason and you still can't legally retain that fish if you get stopped and you tell the game warden man but i already shot him i already killed him you're still going to get a ticket don't shoot fish that are iffy or even close to the line any fish you shoot should be they should make you go, wow, I want that fish right there, right? And that's the fish you're going to shoot at. All right, so we got underwater and we're hunting. Uh, again, you've got the water magnification, magnification to take into account. Um, always keep the gun pointed in a safe direction. Uh, I do have zip tied on here so that I can break off with a lot of force. I have a little carabiner, okay? Now, this isn't meant to hold fish. This is meant to break if I want it to. This is really only so when I'm swimming to the rig and the gun's unloaded, I can clip this off and use my hands and get under there. And when I'm ready to use the gun, I can unclip it and get it ready. And then while I'm on my hunt, the gun never leaves my hands and it never gets connected to me in any way. When I get done at the end of the dive, I come up and usually at my safety stop, I will unload the gun and I will clip it off and let it hang for my swim back to the boat. Don't connect this to yourself while you're hunting. Again, that's a really bad idea. This is really just for while I'm traveling and I'm not actually hunting. So this doesn't get used all that often. Okay. Uh, when you get underwater and you find your fish and you line up to take your shot, <laughs> and everybody, I'm sure everybody who's ever spearfished has done this before, you're gonna pull the trigger one of these days and nothing's gonna happen. You go, oh, oh crap, I forgot to take the safety off, right? That's a real common mistake. Don't forget to take your safety off before you pull the trigger. Right now, the fish is out in front of you, and you're aiming at your fish. Okay, and he's coming. Let's say he's moving from left to right, he's moving this way. What I want to do to aim at my fish is I want to aim where the fish is going, not where the fish is at right now. So, if the fish is over here on the left, and he's moving this way, when I go to point my gun at that fish, I don't want to point my gun over here, I'm going to point my gun over there and I'm gonna allow the fish to swim right in front of my gun and they will they will swim right in front of it if you don't point it right at them and when as soon as they get in front of the gun you pull the trigger the problem with the fish being here and you pointing at the fish is that fish knows you're pointing something at them and he, they don't like it they really don't they view it as a threat it is a threat and they see it as such and what he's gonna do is he's gonna speed up and you're gonna track behind him and you're gonna try to swing your arm faster and faster to get up here on the head into the fish to pull the trigger, but you're never gonna get your shot because every time you speed up, he speeds up. So you never quite get ahead of the fish and you're pointing at him and doing this the whole time and just scaring him off. But again, the best thing to do is when a fish is coming by and if he's moving whatever direction, uh, just for this example, left to right, when the fish is on my left, I'm going to pull the gun up and point it where he's going and not where he's at. And when I do that, honestly, I'm going to try not to make eye contact with the fish. I'm going to watch him out of the corner of my eye, but I'm not going to be looking directly at him. Fish are aware when you're looking at them, and it makes them more skittish. That's another benefit of tinted masks. A lot of people use tinted masks. The fish can't see your eyes so well. For me, I scuba, and it makes it harder for me to see down at deeper depth, so I don't use a tinted mask anymore, but it does have the benefit of hiding your eyes. So when that fish is approaching me, if he, especially if he's curious enough, he's coming in to get a close look, I'm gonna point my gun where I think he's going, and I'm gonna try not to look and turn my head directly at him. I'll kind of look out of the corner of my eye and use my peripheral vision and, and get him to try to swim out right in front of the gun, and as soon as he does, I'm gonna pull the trigger. Now, 
you do want to wait for that profile shot it's much easier to shoot a fish that's this way than this way when you hit a fish this way, even if you hit them dead on, it's likely to hit bone and just veer off and you're not going to get your fish. Grouper do this. They come up and they face you and they're gone. You don't really get a profile shot, right? Sheep's head, they'll come up and do this all day long. But that's optimistically the shot you want is a perfectly perpendicular profile shot. Now, aiming on the fish, right? You want to... I drew a little simple generic little sheep's head here okay here's my sheep's head the blue is his outline the red are his bones right down here this is his gut cavity when you shoot at a fish what are you aiming for right so if this is my sheep's head what I want to aim for is this little black square right here that's what I want to hit and that's there's the gill plate that's right in the middle of the gill plate and there's the spinal cord where the, the skull, the spinal cord attaches to the skull. The perfect shot would sever that spinal cord right behind the skull. Unfortunately, that's, that's easier said than done with underwater and things are moving around and it's not a gun. It doesn't shoot that fast. It's really hard, hard to hit them in this really small spot. Okay, but ultimately that's what you're trying to hit underneath is hit that spinal cord. Okay, now without the background, here's just the silhouette and kind of what you're going to aim for. And ultimately, I would say your general goal should be to hit the fish somewhere in the gill plate, not behind the gill plate, but on this side of the gill plate, but behind the eyeball. I would say directly in the middle between the eyeball and the gill plate, right about there, it's probably about the perfect spot you can hit them. Because if you don't hit the spine, if you hit them in the gill plate or the head somewhere, there's a pretty good chance you're either going to stone them or just the impact of the shaft hitting them will stun them and they will just stop moving for a solid 10-15 seconds and then they kind of come too but that gives you time to get down there and get hands on the fish right but that should be kind of your aim point you don't want to hit anywhere down here in the gut cavity because the shaft will probably tear out it's not a very solid point and if they're fighting really hard it can just pull out and you don't generally want to hit anywhere up here or back here because that's your edible meat that's what you want to eat and if you hit that fish right there it's going to be a good solid attachment point but when you go to fillet your fish, this fillet up here is going to be trashed. It's going to have a really big hole in it. The shaft makes a really ugly hole as it goes through. So if you can hit them in the eye, that works too. Just aim for somewhere from the eye to the gill plate, somewhere right in that range. All right? Now, it's very common when you aim these guns because we don't aim these like a rifle where you close one eye and look down the barrel that's not how you aim these guns with these guns you're holding your arm out at arm's length and you're placing the gun between you and the fish and pulling the trigger the problem with that is the guns in the way so you have to lower the gun to see what you're aiming at so the problem with that now is now you're pointing the gun down so you have to compensate by pointing the gun back up a little bit but now you're not looking down the sight and it's kind of awkward it's kind of awkward to aim this way Okay, now, I can say from experience, for me anyway, most missed shots, when I shoot a fish and I completely miss, it was a low shot. It went low, went under the fish almost every time. It's because the shaft dropped and the fish scrammed and the shot went low almost every single time. So, when you go to aim at your fish and when you're aiming for that eye gill plate region, it's probably not a bad idea to aim a little bit high. When I say a little bit, I'm talking maybe just above the eyeball, not above the fish, okay? Just above the eyeball. Now the fish are moving. You think you want to lead them a little bit. When you go to pull the trigger, as they're moving, you want to lead them some. You do want to lead them just a little bit, but I'm talking maybe a couple of inches. When you pull the trigger, they're not that far from the end of the gun the shaft they're not going to travel a whole lot before the shaft gets there so if you want to lead them lead them an inch or two don't lead out like way out in front of the fish because again you'll probably hit them way out here in the lips okay all right so again i've already stated you know maximum ranges for these guns i would say 10 feet if it's further than 10 feet get closer he's too far away if you can get closer than 10 feet by all means get closer than 10 feet i mean if you could swim up and jam this into the fish before you pull the trigger do it get as close as you can it's only going to help right 
All right, so when you're underwater and you're hunting and you're moving this gun around, the longer the gun, especially the big offshore gun, it's hard to maneuver, it's hard to turn fast. The fish can swim by you really fast. Amberjack will come by and they'll buzz right by you. You go to point your gun at them and you're kind of fighting the water resistance with your gun. There's a couple of tricks you can use to move your gun faster in the water. Instead of holding it out at arm's length and swiveling your whole body around, trying to chase this fish down, the quickest method for probably swiveling your gun is to pull your gun in a little bit, spread your hands apart, lower it, and repoint it the direction you want it. This is much faster underwater than this is, right? Lower the gun, just rotate your hands and pull the gun back up on the direction you want it pointed at. That will, that will be much faster than swinging the gun through the water, right? Uh, hand placement, generally, you don't want this hand up here holding this line. This line's going to go that way with the shaft, and if it gets caught in your fingers, it's going to hurt your hand. You don't really want your hand up here. I will put my hand here sometimes, but if you're going to put your hand up here under the barrel, you need to keep an open palm like this and just rest it on top of your hand. I don't really do that a whole lot, honestly, but you just don't want to wrap your hands around this because of this retaining line. It's going that way whether you want it to or not, okay? Another way is to, to double grip, like pistol grip it, like you're double fisting a pistol. Or what I find to be pretty convenient, and I probably do most of the time is, again, like I showed with the big gun, is take my left hand and put it on the back of the gun. This helps me maneuver my gun a little bit faster. I could, I could kind of turn my gun side to side a little bit to make minor adjustments right before I make my final shot. But when you go to shoot these guns, any of them, this is not a shoulder stock. A lot of people want to put this on their shoulder and aim it like this. This isn't a rifle. This is for loading the gun. That's really it. When you go to fire this gun, you should lock your elbows. Hold the gun out at arm's length and lock your elbows. Put the gun between you and the fish and pull the trigger. Keep your elbows locked. Or keep this hand back here and lock your right elbow. But either way, your arm should be pretty much fully extended when you're pointing this gun out there. Okay? Now, at the jetties, visibility can be very limited, and sometimes you don't have enough visibility to actually do that. And on some of those days, I will pull the gun back like this, and I'll set this against the side of my arm and hunt just like this. And I'll keep this hand right here, and I'll, and I'll hunt my gun really short range like this. Okay, there's, there's, obviously there's problems with that. I gotta make sure there's not other divers in the water with me. I might shoot somebody in that limited viz. It's a, it's a whole nother realm of diving, but, um, Normally, most circumstances, you're gonna hold this gun out at arm's length to shoot it, okay? Um, let's see. Again, expect recoil. This gun's gonna recoil a little bit. That offshore guns are gonna recoil a whole lot. Like, like kick you, like horse kick you in the mouth kind of uh, a lot, right? And the mid, mid range gun's somewhere in between, but just be aware, they are gonna kick. There is some recoil with these, right? Uh, now, with small fish, after you shoot your fish, you want to go ahead and get to them as quickly as you can, right? So little sheep's head, stuff like that, I'm just going to shoot them. When I see that I've hit my fish, I'm going to let the gun go, and I'm going to grab the line. I'm going to start pulling the fish to me, and I'm just going to let the gun go. Now, depending on the gun, some of them float once the shaft is out. Some float and some sink. Most of mine float. I will let go of the gun, pull the fish to me, and allow the gun to float up out of the way so I'm not getting tangled in all the cable and everything. It's out of the way. The problem with that is if you got a big fish on and he's fighting and he pulls that line out of your hands, everything's gone. He's going to take off with your gun, right? So don't let go of that line, especially if it's cable. It tends to slide through your hands real easy. Um, you know, so on what you probably want to do on bigger fish like amberjack and things like that with the bigger gun is when amberjack or cobia or something like that's approaching me, I tend to stay close to structure so that when a big amberjack or something like that comes up to me, I want that like a horizontal on a rig, something like that to be close by so that when that fish comes and does uh, his flyby and I get a shot on them, the first thing they're usually going to do is sound. They're going to try to go straight down. If there's a horizontal there, I can also, as soon as I pull the trigger, I'm going to drop, I'm going to try to get underneath and and take that clip and clip the gun to the line and now that amberjack can fight it out down there if i have to come up whatever i can go back down and get them later 
Um, normally I don't do that, I just fight them out, but I allow them to kind of wrap themselves till I can get them pinned, get the knife in there to get the kill on them, right? Right, right between the eyes, right in the top of the head. Just stick that pointy knife in there and twist it, and then uh, dispatch them as quick as you can, okay? Now, either way, once you shoot your fish, you wanna get to the fish as quickly as possible, get them to you. Once you get to the fish, the first thing you wanna do is Get your hand into his gills. Get inside that gill plate and just grab his throat. Get your thumb in one side and the fingers in the other. And if you bottom out up at the very top of his gills right here, you will be able to get a death grip on that fish that he can't get away from, okay? It's at that point that you're gonna take out your kill knife and the kill knife should be long and pointy, right? Shouldn't have a blunt tip or a slanted tip. I'd use a long pointy tip and just shove that in right between his eyes, right? right behind the eyes, but right in the top of the head, and shove that in there, and just kind of give it a twist. They'll usually do some twitching, and they're done after that. Just be careful with smaller fish when you got your hand inside his, his throat like that, that you don't stab so deep that you stab yourself in the hand, right? I've, I've seen people do that. Um, once you kill him, he's gonna stop fighting. That's the whole point of killing him, right? You don't want him thrashing around. That tends to attract a lot of tension from barracuda and sharks. Uh, once you get them to you though, those barracuda and sharks generally won't won't come up close. They'll get kind of excited They'll start buzzing getting a little bit closer to you But they generally won't come up and try to take it from you if they do come up and try to take it from you You just let them have that fish. It's not worth losing a, a foot or an arm over right? So once you get your fish killed, then you're gonna take your stringer Right here's a an example of a fish stringer. Some of these are round, some of them are oval. This is just the one I have at the moment. It's got a clip for attaching it to me. It's got a simple, like old school uh, diaper pin, right? This was pretty blunt. I made a little bit more of a point to this, but you're gonna take your fish, once you dispatch him, you poke him onto here and hook this back on and string him. Now, when you string your fish, this is not a, this is not a, a stringer you're using while you're waiting. You're not gonna go up through the gills and come out the mouth and put him on here this way. You're not trying to keep him alive. You just punched a hole this big through him. You just stabbed him in the brain and twisted it to kill him. So he should be dead at this point. So there's no point in going up through the gills. I would take this point, and what I do with every single fish is, with a fish vertical this way and his eyes on either side, I go in one eye and out the other eyeball straight through both eyes and he will sit on here just like this if you go up through the gills that fish is gonna sit on here like this and you're only gonna get like four fish before you run out of space on your stringer stack them sideways and you can get a lot more fish on here right but there's a basic stringer I will string my fish I will clip this to me and then after I've killed the fish, I've strung him, I've attached the stringer to me, then I remove the spear shaft from the fish. And I don't do that until I've strung him and I've connected the stringer to me. Because if everything comes loose and the fish comes out of my hands, I don't want him to go anywhere. He's connected to me no matter what, right? So at that point, you can string him, reload your gun, and continue hunting and continue stringing fish if that's what you're going to do. Um, I don't really recommend stringing fish and carrying this around with you. Because you're just, you know, you're a pile of steaks in the Sahara waving at a bunch of lions, right? And that's essentially what you're doing, swim around all these fish connected to you. So, what I'll do a lot of times if we have a downline or something like that is I'll swim over there and I'll connect this to our downline. Every time I shoot a fish, I'll swim over there, string them, and then go back to my hunting. And I don't really stay around this very often. Surprisingly, you would think the sharks and the barracuda would use that as an opportunity when you move away to come in and attack these fish. But honestly, I've never really had that be a problem. They, the line and all the stuff kind of moving around in the current, they tend to just kind of, honestly, they tend to kind of keep their distance from it. So that's basically the gist of it. Um, multiple guns for multiple purposes. These smaller guns this size are more inshore. Um, you know, you can go up to medium size, which is a little over four foot, all the way up to like six, seven foot guns for offshore. Uh, they serve different purposes. Smaller guns are better for closer range, limited viz. The bigger guns are better for offshore. Uh, when it comes to retaining lines, you can use the the actual um, 
I can't remember what Dyneema, I, I think. I can't remember the material this is made of. This is pretty strong stuff. There's also cable. Honestly, with the cable, I prefer coated cable. Uh, over time, those little strands, that's seven strand cable, those little strands will break and they do this. You have a little flyaway sticking out of the cable and when you go to string it, even through your gloves sometimes, those things will really poke you. Uh, the coating, the coated cable really helps eliminate that. Uh, it also helps eliminate some of the kinks in the line as well. Right, but the heavier shafts, again, they have a little bit better range and a little bit better punch, but they shoot slower. You know, thinner shafts, they'll shoot a lot faster. Um, they're pretty good at close range and they're real fast, but out there at longer distances, if he's out on the edge of, of your range, they're just going to kind of peter out a little bit quicker. Right, um, and that's... That's really essentially it. Uh, again, this was mostly for beginners and people that don't know what they're doing. Maybe learn a little bit more about the basics of the guns and a few just just the simple uh, the simple basics of spear fishing and, and what's going on with these guns. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and um, I guess that's it. Y'all have a good day.